It has been an emotional day for me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just because I felt the presence of the Holy Ghost so strongly today. Yes. Before we go any further, I wanted to say some special prayer also. I forgot to say say prayer. I wanted to say some special 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 prayer for a minister or a friend of mine that was involved in a motorcycle accident and is in the intensive care in critical condition. His name is Tom Foster. Let's say a per quick prayer that God will oh, bring him just to have God walk into that hospital room this morning and touch my friend Tom you Foster see, God. In the name of Brother Jesus. Foster, Lord Jesus, give him have a right your way in his life. God, I'm asking you to God touch heal you. those ribs. God, unfracture that spine, Lord, that human tone of my God that is in his head and in his brain, my God, believe me, my Lord, stop that in the name of Jesus, bring him out of critical condition and out of intensive care, and heal him in the name of Jesus, I pray. Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I honestly didn't know what I was going to talk about this morning service until last night, yesterday evening, God began to work uh, on me about something, and so I want to turn your attention this morning to the book of Luke. <coughs> I want to go to chapter 17 and verse 1. Book of Luke, chapter 17 and verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that now. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he is he was talking to them and then almost seemingly out of the blue he drops this little verse in there. And it simply says that then Jesus said unto his disciples that It is impossible for offenses not to come into your life. But woe unto him through whom they come. Lord Jesus, I am asking you this morning to anoint my words. Lord, let me present you to the to the people, Lord, in the way that you have presented this to me. Help me, my God, to be gentle. Help me to deliver this in a spirit of love and help those that are here and those that are listening to me on the internet, Lord, take this in a spirit of love and understanding that revelation come into people's lives this morning, God, and let no one be offended in the name of Jesus. I want to talk to you this morning for a short time on the subject offenses. <coughs> I want to tell you that there are many times in our life that if we allow ourselves to be offended, those offenses are going to come to us. No doubt, no, no doubt there are those of you here this morning and listening to me today, that were offended by something just this week. Something that you saw, something that you heard, something that someone did or said to you. Somebody offended us. And the Bible says it's impossible that those offenses are not going to come to you. It's impossible to go through life without someone doing something that you find offensive. Right. On a daily basis, <laughs> I run across someone that does something that to me is offensive. It's just a fact of life, especially in the world in which we live. When people have no moral compass, when perversion runs rampant through the world and wrong is called right and right is called wrong and everything is topsy-turvy and things that we used to hold sacred or despised nowadays and things that we used to despise people encourage and cheer. This world itself sometimes seems to be offensive. But the Bible says that we should not offend 
But would it surprise you if I told you that the Bible also says that it's wrong to be offended? Now, offenses are going to come, but you don't have to let the offenses stick in your heart and begin to grow. The Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 19, he who loves transgression loves strife. Offenses are nothing more than strife. Offenses are things that we look at and go, that upsets me. I don't like that. That goes against my grain. That goes against what I want. That goes against what I feel. It goes against what I believe. It goes against everything within my being. I don't like that. If we allow offenses into our life and we let them stay in our life and we stay offended, they will very quickly grow into resentment. And we will begin to resent the people that have offended us. That resentment will begin to fester within our hearts. We will begin to resent the fact that they're doing okay in life. We will re begin to resent the fact that they got a decent job. We will re get, begin to resent the fact that they bought a new car or that they live in a nice house or that they're happy in life or, or that something good has come to them or those that they love. We will begin to resent that. And if we let that resentment grow, it begins to become bitterness. And that bitterness in our heart begins to take root, and we begin to look at them, and we begin to despise them, and we begin to look at them in, with, with shaded eyes, and if we let that bitterness stay, it becomes anger. And before you know it, you're always angry about that person and at that person. The anger begins to well up within us, and now all of a sudden, somebody can say their name, and it just shakes us to the core. Somebody can talk about something that they've done, and it just makes us mad. We're angry at that person. If we let that anger grow, it soon turns into hatred. It's true. <clears throat> now, we hate the very sight of that person. We can't stand that person. That person has done me wrong, and I don't want to hear their name. I don't want to see them out and about. When I'm at the grocery store and I see them, I hate their guts. I don't want to be around them. Don't mention their name to me. I hate that person. And that hatred begins to grow and fester within our hearts. That's true. And soon, that hatred turns into rage. That's true. We begin to rage about everything around us. We begin to rage at that person. And every time somebody mentions that person's name, it sets us off and we are off and running to the races with our anger and our hurt and our bitterness and our rage and we are just living about the things that that person represents in our lives and to us. And we just rage. Before long, that rage turns into an addiction. You can become addicted to rage and it will release the same chemical in your brain that cocaine and laughter and fun and joy releases, and that is called dopamine. When you become addicted to rage, when you begin to rage about something, and when you confront a situation, and you allow your temperature to, to, to rise, and you allow your heartbeat to come up, and you allow yourself to get into a, 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 a fit of rage, it releases that dopamine, and we begin to become addicted to rage. I know people that are addicted to rage. I know people that you can talk to them, and every time you talk to them, they're upset about something. They're upset about the same things over and over and over. And it doesn't matter how life has, has, has gone through and, that what, and what has happened in their life. That one thing triggers them, and that rage comes to the surface. It's an addiction to rage, and they don't even realize that they're addicted to it. That's true. I told those men this morning, I said, you know something, I will always say the truth to you. Because there are many of them that come to me and say, when I get out of jail, I want 
you to be my mentor. I want you to be my person of accountability. I want you to be my counselor. And I always tell them the same thing. That is not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. But when you start straying off of the path, I'm going to tell it to you. And I'm going to, I'm going to call you onto the carpet. And I'm going, to, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to say it. But there's a way to say it. There's a way to confront problems. There's a way to confront offenses. There's a way to confront situations in your life that cause other people not to hate your guts. Just saying the truth sometimes is not enough. The Bible says there's a time for everything and every purpose under the sun. I'm not saying that we don't confront sin. I'm not saying that we don't confront things that are wrong and we don't and, and we change our beliefs and we compromise our 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 theology and our worldviews. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it should be said in a spirit of love. Mm -hmm. I hear people a lot of the times and you will tell them something, well, that, that, that biblically that's wrong. Well, you shouldn't judge me. Well, I'm not judging you. I always direct them to Ezekiel 3.19 which says, Yet if thou warned the wicked and he turned not from his wickedness or his wicked ways he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And that's quite a little scripture. But if you go to the next one, and I always tell them, I say, but you've got to read verse 20 also. And verse 20 says, And again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him a warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But if you did not warn him, the last piece of that verse is, but his blood will I require at thy hand. When you tell someone in a spirit of love that they're wrong, that's not judging them, that's warning them. But when you get into a rage and you begin to criticize and you begin to tell someone just because you can tell them off, just because you can put them in their place, just because you can bully them, just because you can intimidate them, that's when it becomes offensive and that's when you become the offender. And that is when you start doing damage to your soul and to theirs too. The Bible says that pure gold is tried by fire. Pure gold is soft and pliable. The purest of gold, you can take it and you can bend it and you can move it and you can mold it, you can turn it, you can make it into something with your bare hands because it's, it's, it's very soft. And the way they, they refine gold is it's usually mixed with some other type of metal and, and, and jewelers consider that to be a contaminant. And so they will... They will grind that into powder and then they will put flux in there and they will heat it and melt it. And the gold being heavier than the rest of the metal will drop and the other will be attached to the flux and they will draw that out of there and they will refine the gold. And the Bible says in Job, and Job went through some serious trials and tribulations. There are none of us that, have, that know Job's situation that can sit back and say, uh, Job didn't have it that bad. Job went through some pretty bad stuff. There was a lot of offenses came into Job's life. Oh, yeah, that's right. But Job said, and I believe it was 23 and 10, he said, he knows the way that I take. He knows the path that I walk. He knows the direction that I'm going. And when he had tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Not just that he would be beautiful and he would be he would be worth a lot to, to, to someone. That not that he would be, be precious, but it's that he would be pliable in the hands of the jeweler. He would, it, the, the Bible talks about the potter and how the potter makes the vessel. We don't make what we are. We, we are on the potter's wheel and the potter's hand begins to form us. Some people will test you to the limits. They True. will. There are people that test my limits sometimes. And I try, I try to be 
patient. They try to be kind and loving and, and understanding with most people and well with everyone. But sometimes people just push me to the limit. And I have to get on my knees and go, Lord, give me patience with this person. God, give me direction to help this person. Lord, lead me and guide me and give me a spirit of discernment and discretion so that I can, I can help them, Lord. I can discern and the, 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 the way that they should take and, and give them the advice and the counseling that they need, Lord. Help me, oh God, not to be offended that they're so offended about everything. Here's the thing. You're going to go through trials and you're going to go through tribulations and it's impossible that offenses are not going to come to you. But until you pass the test, until you stop raging, until you stop letting yourself get out of control, until you stop being angry and, and, and upset all the time, God's going to give you the test over and over again. That's this true. is not the test that you take in school and your teacher gives you your grade and says, you failed. But all these other little Tests that you've taken, we're going to average them out and see if you can pass to the next grade. No, God's going to say, you failed this test. Now take it over, and when you pass it, then you can go to the next test. That's true. You are going to have to pass the test and get rid of the rage and get rid of the anger and get rid of the offenses that are coming to your life and stuck there for so many years. You're going to have to get rid of them before you can pass the test. I didn't know who was going to be here this morning. I didn't know who was going to be watching this morning. I didn't know who was going to be listening to me today. But God gave me this, this message for somebody. You know who you are. You know who you are. You know what God is trying to say to you this morning. Take those offenses and wrap them up and lay them at the foot of the cross and give them to yes. God and let him have them. Yes. Because you're going to go through the test and the trial and the tribulation and the hardship until you pass the test. Right. It's true. Trials and tribulations are not fun. No. They are not fun to go through. Not at all. But if you can pass the test, the results and the consequences of having those trials and tribulations in your life will be golden. There is a time and a place for everything under the sun. And sometimes we have to face it that we're the wrong person for the job. Let somebody else do something. You might be the person that, that that offends that person. Don't go to them and try to straighten them out. If you're the person that they don't like, don't take offense. Don't take offense at what I'm saying this morning. But don't take offense at what people do to you on a daily basis. It's not worth letting them control your life. Right. When somebody begins to offend you and you begin to let the anger and the resentment and the bitterness and the hatred and the rage begin to grow within you, you are allowing them to control your walk with yes. God. Yes. You are allowing them to take control of your life. It doesn't bother them. They're walking on down the road. They're still chewing their gum and eating their steaks and going fishing and doing all the things that they do while you're sitting over here raging and being upset about what they've done to you. 15 minutes or 15 years ago, it does not matter. Right. Do not let the offenses stay in your life. Had a young man raise his hand this morning. He said, but pastor, how do you get rid of the offense that's been stuck in your life for years? How do I let that go? The way you let go of the offenses is you forgive the person for what they've done. Mm -hmm. And before you say, well, I cannot forgive them for what they've done. They did this to me. They molested me. They, they hurt me. They robbed me. They, they whatever, whatever it was. You can. You're not the person of divinity. You're not so important that you're going to do something by forgiving them. You're not doing a, a thing for that person when you say, I forgive you. You're not God. You can't judge them and send them to hell or judge them and send them to heaven. You are not divinity. You don't have that power. Only God has that power. The only thing you do is you do something for yourself. You allow God to begin to pull out the root of bitterness and the hatred and the rage that has been binding you for so many years and has been causing you so much heartache and trial. God is putting some of you through a test because you can't pass the test and get past the anger 
you're in the rage, you'll take the test until you do. Or until you give up on God. They asked, they said, well, how do we forgive someone that has done such grievances and offended us so deeply? He said, how do we pray for that? He said, pray in this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy, precious, wonderful Savior, you are great and greatly to be praised. Give us this day our daily bread. Spiritually and physically, give us that that we need. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh God, keep me from the snare of the fowler. Keep me, oh God, from walking into the traps of Satan. And forgive us as we forgive others. That person that you haven't forgiven, they have a control on your life and God's looking at you going, until you forgive them, I can't forgive you. Until you forgive them, I can't rip out those seeds of bitterness and those seeds of hatred and that seed of rage and that addiction that you have to the anger and the rage that's burning within you. I can't rip that out. And until you get that out of your life, those people that are doing you wrong, they can't feel that release. And you can't give that release and you can't get it out of your system and out of your life. And so it binds you each and every day, each and every hour, each and every minute, each and every second. You're bound by it. Somebody mentions their name. Somebody brings up the subject and immediately you're triggered. Don't take offenses and hold on to them and tuck them away inside. It's not worth it. They're not worth your time and your energy and the destruction of your life and your soul. They're not worth that. Let it go. And forgive us as we forgive those who offend us. We're not divine. Tell God, Lord, you can do more than I can. You cleanse me. The day that I close my eyes in death, I will stand before God naked without anything except my reputation and my legacy and the life that I lived for God here on this earth. I won't take my houses and my cars and my money and my guns and my boat, my fishing equipment. I won't take all my earthly possessions. I won't be dressed in a beautiful suit and and nice, soft leather shoes. I will stand before him as I am, naked and undone, a wretched man that I am, and he will judge me for what I have done. But he will also judge the other people that have done whatever they do. Don't be judged for what they did to you. Let it go so that you are only judged for the things that you have done. Don't offend people, but don't be offended because it will begin to grow into something that will destroy your life. Right. Can you imagine a world without offenses on both sides of the coin? Can you imagine a world where nobody offended anybody and nobody would let someone else offend them? There would be no need for war. There would be no need for apologies or pain or suffering or, or hard feelings or... It would almost be the Garden of Eden again. I can't even imagine that. But what I can tell you is that God sent me here today, not knowing who was going to be here, not knowing who would be watching this program on the internet. He sent me to tell you, don't be offended by the things that have happened to you in your life. Let it go. Let those offenses pass from you because until you do, you will go through the same trials and tribulations and the same test that you've been going through and failing that test over and over and over. Let it go and let God have control of it. Yes. Once you let God have it, 
the freedom and the peace and the comfort and the joy of the Holy Ghost can begin to fill that void. If a seed drops onto the ground and begins to grow, that little acorn drops right down there by the foundation of your home. And it comes up and it's a cute little plant. And you're looking at it and saying, well, you know what? If I let it grow, it's going to turn into a tree. It would be easier at this moment to take that little piece of plant or vegetation that's newborn, new life, and pull it up. But if you let it grow in 30, 40 years, it's going to crack the foundation of your house. And then you're going to have to get a tractor, and you're going to have to get chainsaws, and you're going to have to get people, and you're going to have to get manpower, and you're going to have to get trucks, and you're going to have to begin to extricate that tree and those, those roots out from underneath the foundation of that home. And you're going to have to begin to do more, more work than you ever could imagine. And you're going to have to repair the home where it was damaged and destroyed. Where when it was just the baby of an offense, you could have walked over and picked it up and thrown it away into the trash and said, I give it to you, God. But now all of a sudden, you're looking at it and going, I don't know how to forgive them for what they've done. I don't know how to forgive them for a lifetime of abuse and for a lifetime of ridicule at me and for a lifetime of sneering and turning their noses up at me when I'm around them. Let it go. It doesn't matter. They're not worth your time. They're not worth the destruction of your soul. They're not worth the loss of your redemption and your salvation. Right. Sure as I am standing here this morning, God gave me this message. And if God gave me this message, take it to heart and search your soul. Are you holding anything against anybody? Are you upset with someone for something? Has somebody wronged you and you haven't let it go? Has somebody wronged you and you have to talk about it and you have to rage about it and you have to be upset about it? If those people keep doing what they're doing, don't go around them. And let go of the things that they have done to you. Begin to heal your soul. Begin to let God take control of it. And begin to let him put the balm of Gilead into your life and heal you. Haven't you had enough? Haven't you been pushed far enough to the edge by the devil and his traps and snares that he has created and put in your life that have caused you to fall over and over and over again? Haven't you, haven't you gotten to the limit yet? Haven't you woken up yet? God is calling you today. And if you'll just give it to me, I'll change your world. Yes. God doesn't give someone a message like this for no reason. It was perfect timing that I would give this message today. It was divine providence that God gave it to me today. Because God does not make mistakes. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Please take this in a spirit of love. I give it in a spirit of love. <coughs> It's not worth letting other people control you. <clears throat> yes. Don't let it happen. It's, 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 why let them be bigger than your redemption? Why let them overshadow your salvation? Why let them say, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take your joy. I'm going to take your salvation. I'm going to take your victory. I'm going to take what God has planned for you. And trust me when I tell you, God said, I know my plans for you. And they're not plans that are bad plans. They're plans that are good plans. I plan to give you good things. I plan to make you great. I plan to live you a good life. But until you pass a test, until you go, I give up, God, take it. He's going to keep giving you the test over and over until you learn it. Nobody has the right to destroy your joy. Nobody has the right to destroy 
that that God has planned for your life. But we, through the offenses and the holding on to that, that, that thing, the, the thing that, that causes us to go, I'm going to get back at him someday. Someday I'm going to have the last word. Someday it's all going to balance out and I'm going to find out that they did something and, I'm, and I got even with them. That's not what God's trying to call you to do. God's trying to call you to say, give it to me, lay it in my feet. Lay it in my feet and let me have it. Jesus. Put it at the cross. Oh, yes. That's right. Oh, God. You have the power oh, Jesus. of forgiveness. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You have the power to say, God, I'm going to let you have it. I can't carry this burden anymore. I can't, I can't bear this anymore. God, you've, you've taught me the lesson. I've learned the lesson. Job lost everything he had. Everything that he had. His houses. His, his stock. His livestock. His children. He lost everything that he had. And he sat by a fire covered with sores. And he's got a shell and he's scraping the sores, scraping the pus out of the sores. And his wife, that rotten soul of a woman, come to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? You know what that precious man said? Though he cursed me, yet will I trust in him. Though he kill me, yet will I trust in him. Get to the point where you say, Lord, I've had enough. You take control. You take it from me. I give it to you. There's an old song that says something beautiful, something good. All of my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Without God, you have nothing. You've got brokenness and strife. Has your life not come to a point to where you say, God, I surrender. They're not worth me being miserable any longer. They're not worth me thinking about them night and day, what they've done to me. Thinking about them every second of every hour and thinking, they did me wrong. So what? Let God have it. Let him take care of it. That's right. Hallelujah. I don't know how to put it any plainer. God, you have to do the rest. Let's stand. Mm -hmm. 